Okay, in today's lecture, we're going to review some basic tools that we'll need so that we can move on from just talking about high-level forces on aircraft to getting into more details of how the fluid mechanics results in those forces. So this is going to be a review of your second year fluid mechanics. vector calculus and differential equations. So some of the key takeaways from your second year particularly fluids, are things like that forces are exerted by fluids on bodies, by only two mechanisms. pressure and shear stress. Pressure acts normal to a surface and shear stress acts tangent to a surface. You also learned that you can apply uh, the momentum equation um, to determine the forces on a control volume. Also, you learn to apply the continuity or mass conservation equations and Bernoulli's equation to help you solve incompressible fluid problems. You also learned a little bit about how to perform dimensional analysis and you spent some time talking about fluid statics forces that act on a fluid that isn't flowing so the topics that we're going to review today are as follows. We're going to start off with dimensional analysis. Uh, and along with that is flow similarity. Next is fluid statics, we'll talk about briefly. And the focus here will be on buoyancy, which has some aeronautical applications. Then we'll talk about types of flow, regimes, compressible, incompressible, etc. Then we'll talk about a phenomenon in viscous flows, which is boundary layers. Then take a quick vector calculus review and just make sure we're all on the same page about the concepts of gradient, divergence, 
and curl. Then we'll do a brief review of the governing equation. That's basically mass and momentum. Finally, we'll spend a little time talking about Bernoulli's equation. Okay, so first topic is dimensional analysis. This is from section 1.7 of the textbook. So the question we're trying to address here is what physical quantities determine the aerodynamic forces and moments on a given body. So to answer this, let's consider some certain airfoil. It doesn't matter what it is. At some specified angle of attack. So let's draw this out. Got our airfoil. Here's the cord line. Extend that outward. And here's our incoming free stream velocity, the infinity. So the angle of attack is alpha. There's some net resultant force R on this airfoil and it has cord length C. In addition to the free stream velocity to specify the conditions fully in the free stream there's some free stream density rho infinity, a free stream viscosity mu infinity and a free stream speed of sound A infinity. Now R is the resultant force. So the vector R is equal to the sum of the lift and drag vectors. And as I mentioned, C is the chord. So, based on physical intuition, we might expend, expect the resultant force R to depend on the following things. V infinity, rho infinity, mu infinity, C, and A infinity. Now let's uh, see why we expect the force to depend on each of these quantities. So for V infinity, 
if v infinity equals zero, well, then we would expect the resultant force to be zero. So we then expect that as v infinity increases, the resultant force should also increase. So we can see this because even if we neglect pressure effects, viscosity imposes the no-slip condition at the body surface. So on the surface of the, of the body, the velocity must be zero. So because of that, there must be some non-zero shear stresses that are present as soon as V infinity is non-zero. Next, let's talk about rho infinity. Well, we can think about this the same way. If this was zero, that would mean we're, the body is located in a vacuum. And so again, we'd expect the resultant force to be zero. And so once again, as the density increases, we would expect that the resultant force increases as well. Physically, what that means is that there's more fluid mass involved uh, in interaction with the body. So there's a greater opportunity for transfers of momentum between the fluid and the body. Now the viscosity mu, this is related to shear stress. And you probably saw in your course in fluids in second year that the shear stress tau for what we call a Newtonian fluid is the viscosity times velocity gradient, normal to the surface. The cord is a representative size for the object. If it's the same airfoil, we could scale it up or down, so we don't really need to think about the thickness as being separate from the length or the cord, but we do need to consider one geometric parameter. And it stands to reason from our everyday experience that all other things being equal, the resultant force R should increase when C increases. Finally, we've got the free stream speed of sound, A naught. Now this is the, the least obvious of these quantities. Now you'll learn more about this late in your third year fluids course later this term if you're taking it now. But the compressibility of the fluid is related to the speed of sound. And compressibility has to do with density variations, which is a pretty intuitive definition of what compressibility means. So therefore, if the density is varying, we would expect R to vary with rho. So all of these factors, we can see, it's reasonable to think would have an impact on the force on the body. So we can then write this out functionally, that R is some unknown function of rho infinity, V infinity, C, mu infinity, and A infinity. We'll call that equation one. Now this is a lot of parameters.
Now, when you learned about dimensional analysis in second year fluids, you probably learned about something called the Buckingham Pi theorem. This tells us that fewer quantities than all of these ones listed here are actually needed to describe the functional dependence of R. So using the Buckingham Pi theorem, we can rewrite this equation as follows. Some unknown function of R rho infinity, B infinity, C mu infinity, and A infinity is equal to zero. And the Buckingham Pi theorem has to do with the fundamental dimensions of the problem. So the fundamental dimensions here are mass, length, and time. So for example, velocity involves length and time. Density involves mass and length. So the dimension of the problem, which in Buckingham Pi notation we call k, is 3. 1, 2, 3. That's the dimension of the problem. Now what we need to do is figure out what the physical dimension of each of the parameters or the physical variables in the problem are. So these are for R, we use this symbol, the square brackets to indicate the units of a quantity or its dimensions. So for R, we have mass times length times time to the minus two. That's force. For rho infinity, we have mass times length to the minus three. Right? Kilograms per meter cubed, for example. For V infinity, we have length times time to the minus one meters per second. For C, just the length. U infinity, M L inverse T inverse. That's the units of viscosity. Kilograms per meter per second. And finally, A infinity, the speed of sound, so this has the same dimensions as velocity. So again, using Buckingham Pi theorem notation, n is 6. This is our six physical variables. Okay, so that leaves us n minus k, which is 6 minus 3 equals 3 dimensionless variables. So we can rewrite the governing equation as some function f2 of dimensionless parameter pi 1, dimensionless parameter pi 2, and dimensionless parameter pi 3 equals 0. Now, if we pick three variables, say rho infinity, 
B infinity and the chord C. And what's important is that these contain all three fundamental dimensions. Then we can write the pi factors as follow. Pi 1 is some other function of rho infinity, v infinity, c, and r, which is one of the other physical parameters. Pi 2 is another function of rho infinity, v infinity, C and mu infinity and then we've only got one physical parameter left so this must be the speed of sound A infinity now one thing that's important to note is that the non-dimensionalization you achieve with the Buckingham Pi theorem isn't unique but Often, there are certain ways that you can achieve a result which are, provide the most physical insight into the problem. So let's start by working on pi 1. And we'll assume that pi 1 has the following form. Rho infinity to the A, B infinity to the B, C to the E times R. And then we solve for D to avoid any confusion with uh, the speed of sound A. We'll call that D. So then we solve for D, B, and E. So pi 1 is dimensionless. So if we do that, we get D equals minus 1, B equals minus 2, and E equals minus 2. And if we put that together, we get that pi 1 is R over rho infinity, V infinity squared, C squared. So c squared, this has dimensions of area. So we can replace this with any other useful area that we want. So an example would be a wing plan form area S. A wing plan form area is the wing area as seen from a top view. So That's the wing plane form area. Also, multiplying by a constant doesn't change the meaning of this pi 1. So we can multiply by constants whenever we like. So if we redefine pi 1, we can get this. r over 1 half rho infinity v infinity squared s. So this 
Now, pi 1 is a force coefficient. And we can call this C sub r. That's our first dimensionless parameter. Then, if we look at pi 2 and do a similar type of thing, we get rho infinity, v infinity, h, c to the i, and mu infinity to the j. That gives us pi 2 is rho infinity, v infinity, c over mu. And this, you recall, is the Reynolds number. Specifically, it's the free stream Reynolds number because it depends on the free stream density and free stream velocity. So finally then, we can look at pi 3. And again, we have some exponents to determine. And if we work that out, we'll get pi 3 equals simply v infinity over a infinity. And this is by definition m infinity the free stream Mach number. So now we can put all this together and get that the force coefficient is some still unknown function of the Reynolds number and the Mach number. So now, instead of needing to map r to five other parameters, we can instead map cr to only two parameters. And that's the real power of dimensional analysis.